What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the channel. It's your boy Nick. Big dogs got to eat fantasy football. First thing in the morning, I literally just woke up, threw this tank on, got a big ass cup of coffee, and we're ready to roll with some new hashtag content. Today's gonna be a good episode. I started doing top three sleepers, position by position. Started with the quarterbacks. We're gonna get into the wide receiver position today. Make sure you give the video a thumbs up if you liked it. Subscribe to the channel if you are new. We'll be bringing content all summer into the season as well. All my social media information can be found below. So let's get cracking. Okay, so a lot of moves happened this offseason. A lot of free agency moves that really shook up the wide receiver position, especially for fantasy football. Which brings us to number one on my list. And these are no particular order, just the average draft position starting at lowest to highest, or highest to lowest. First up, Cleveland Browns wide receiver. I know a lot of y'all are probably going to say, ah, Corey Coleman. No, my man's Kenny Britt. Kenny Britt's currently going off the board at wide receiver 50. 126th overall. Now I know like 95% of the fantasy community is going to be focusing on Coleman this offseason, but the play here is Britt. He's going nearly 40 spots after Coleman. Coleman's going, I think, like 88 or 90 overall. Like I said, Britt's like 125. So the value is in Britt. When you look at the contract Britt got this offseason, man, he got some funny money. Four years, $32 million. Look at the other the other wide receivers on the market and what type of money they got. It was like Brandon Marshall, two for 12. Terrell Pryor, who they could have kept, one year, eight mil. Alshon Jeffrey got 14 mil. Kenny Stills resigned, four years, 32 mil. So he matched. There's a lot of good talent out there on the receiving market. And they chose to go with Kenny Britt and gave him the same amount of money as, if not more, than all of those receivers. So that kind of tells you what they think about Britt. And as well as, you know, maybe they're not as high on Coleman as a lot of people think. Now, you know, Britt's been around for a long ass time. This will be his, I think, ninth year in the league. And 2016 was actually the first time he's ever gone over a 1,000 receiving yards. So you're like, why am I so hot on Kenny Britt right now? Fantastic question. And I think it starts with... Corey Coleman, my endorphins for Coleman are not really there anymore. I really liked him coming out of college. I know everyone did. He was a very tantalizing prospect coming out of Baylor, right? But so was Kenny Britt. Britt is you know, 6'3", 225, the very prototypical build. I'm going to show you the picture that I have for him in this article. Because I write a blog post for every one of these. So if, if you're new to the channel, you can go uh, to my website and subscribe. Britt's a savage. Corey Coleman, on the other hand, is not built like a pr prototypical wide receiver. Great prospect, really good talent and all that stuff, but he is not built like Kenny Britt is. And I think Britt is better to man the outside. That being said, so let's look at what Corey Coleman did last year. He had that one big game where he went off for five catches, 104 yards, two touchdowns. Week two of last year, right? And that just like set the record for breakout articles for years to come for Coleman, basically. And then later that week in practice, he broke his hand, which forced him to miss the next six weeks of the season. He came back in week nine, six weeks later, he didn't go over 41 receiving yards a single time for the rest of the season. Now, Britt, on the other hand, playing in St. Louis with the Rams, finished with 68, yard, uh, 68 catches, over 1,000 yards, and five touchdowns. And he was playing with a combination of Case Keenum and Jared Goff at quarterback. And keep in mind, the Rams only had 14 passing touchdowns in total, right? So Britt had five of 14, which is a huge target share, which is it tells you that he was basically their entire offense in the passing game. And I know the quarterback situation, you're saying, yeah, he had a shitty one, but so did Corey Coleman, obviously, in Cleveland. But now they're on a they're on a level playing field, and Britt's moving over from a team that had no running game, no other outside weapons, a terrible offensive line, to a team that has arguably one of the better offensive lines in the league, as well as some other things that I'll touch on in a second. Now, Coleman's already dealing with two injuries in camp. He had a hand injury where he fell on the ball, obviously a lesser concern, because that will just heal. But he's dealing with a hamstring issue, and he dealt with a hamstring issue in the preseason last year too, which forced him to miss a lot of camp. And that's like very big developmental time for, for young guys, for rookies and things like that. And that takes a toll on, you know, how well you're going to play in the season a lot of the time. And hamstring injuries usually linger around. So those are no joke. This is what really stood out to me. NFL.com, I'm just going to read it off to you. NFL.com's Ian Rappaport reports, second year Browns wide receiver Corey Coleman would man the slot if suspended wide receiver Josh Gordon is reinstated for 2017. Them talking about Josh Gordon is not what concerns me. I don't think Josh Gordon's going to see the field in 2017. What concerns me is the fact that they were so quickly to say Corey Coleman is going to be thrown into the slot. 
for me, that says that they don't see him as a real prototype outside receiver. They don't see him as a real outside threat. I know a lot of good receivers make a move into the slot, but that's like Larry Fitzgerald. That's like Brandon Marshall this year. That's at the end of your career. You know, when you can't, you can't win those one-on-one battles and you're not as effective and you're not as fast. So it kind of scares me that, you know, earlier this summer, Hugh Jackson said, you know, Corey Coleman is now the guy at wide receiver. And then they're so quick to say, uh, never mind, because if this guy comes back, then you're no longer the guy. You're, uh, you're that guy over there, right? That's what kind of concerns me. It's more of like a Cleveland Browns confidence in Coleman. And I think that says a lot about him. Back to Britt, though. Back to Britt. Basically, I should just be making a Coleman bus video, right? Not a Britt hype-up video. But Britt, Britt's a veteran wideout. And he's actually not that old, right? I said it's going to be his ninth year. But he's only nine months older than Terrell Pryor. So keep that in mind. Just turned 29. When you're 29, you could have like three or four more really good years in the in the tank. He's got that prototypical build, obviously. Um, he dealt with a lot of maturity issues coming into the league, the beginning, you know, the first few seasons, and that really killed his development, which sucked because he was such a, a hyped prospect coming out of Rutgers. But it looks like he, he finally put those issues aside and was able to capitalize on his talent and his potential last year, and, and, and I guess you could call it a breakout campaign. He's just never really had the opportunity in an offense to, to capitalize on on being the number one, right? He, that was his fourth time going over 700 yards. He had a nine touchdown season back in Tennessee, and he's always making big plays on the sidelines, right? So in his three years in, in uh, St. Louis, he he averaged 15 yards per reception. And last year, uh, that number was 14.7. That was seventh highest in the NFL among all receivers with 100 targets. Okay, he's a legitimate deep threat. What's gonna be interesting is who wins the quarterback situation in Cleveland. You know, reports are surfacing all over the place that the Sean Kaiser is pulling away with that with the job. He's practicing with the ones, and then a report comes out yesterday that you know he's not ready to play. He's not ready to start. If the Sean Kaiser is the quarterback there, I think Britt has a, a really really good year because the Sean Kaiser had arguably the the biggest arm in this year's draft among quarterbacks. He's known for being big, having that cannon arm, not afraid to take shots. And that's perfect when you pair it with someone like Kenny Britt, who's averaging 15 yards of reception. Britt was tied um, for 11th in the NFL last season with with four receptions of 40 yards or more. So he is that guy. You know, he makes plays. He's really good at catching those deep balls. And if you can get a guy like Kaiser, who's not afraid to chuck it up and who likes to utilize his arm, him and Britt are going to work together like, like lamb and tuna fish. So I guess just to wrap it up, it's, you know, I'm not sure I believe in Coleman's talents. He's, he's been injury prone. He was not good when... He finally came back after that one big game he had. And then you have Britt. Finally, you know, got his maturity issues out of the way. Put together a really nice season last year in a really, really bad offense. And now he's moving over to Cleveland, who, you know, it's an arguable upgrade, but I think it is an upgrade at both the quarterback position and just the offense all around. There's more weapons, a better running game, hopefully other weapons on the outside that can help him, you know, get defenders off him. Terrell Pryor's obviously gone, which leaves 140 targets up for grab. So I like the potential here, and like I said, you, you don't have to pick him earlier than like the 10th, 11th, 12th round, so that's why he's one of my sleepers. All right, second up on my list, we move from Cleveland to New York, gangrene, Quincy Anunwa, getting picked 142nd overall, wide receiver 55. That obviously is going to be moving up a lot with the news that Eric Decker is gone. They have Decker and Brandon Marshall both elsewhere now. Anunwa is that number one guy. Them two moving puts 142 targets back up for grab, as well as 25 red zone targets. So, you know, who who better to, to get those targets than Anunwa, right? He was just 24 years old last year when he had his breakout campaign. He led the team with 857 yards receiving, and he had four receiving touchdowns. He tied Brandon Marshall for the most in that category, and they're not a high-scoring offense in terms of passing, so it's, you know, that number's not going to be that high, but... It's good to see him lead in both of those. And what's most promising is he saw 99 targets, 100 targets last year. These two guys are gone. It's almost a floor of 115 to 120 targets. What wide receiver at wide receiver 55 can, can give you a floor like that? It's ridiculous. Looking back at last year, even with Brandon Marshall in the lineup, Brandon Marshall's an elite red zone target. Gets a ton of looks down there. Anunua still led the team in targets inside the 10 yard line, inside the opponent's 10 yard line. He had nine of them, Brandon Marshall only had eight of them. Tells you he's an imposing force. And Nuno's a big dude. He's like 6'2", 2'15", 2'20", really muscular, really ripped up, like prototypical build, a nice target down there in the end zone. And over the first half of the season, he was wide receiver 20 in fantasy. So a legit wide receiver two. And that's with Brandon Marshall in the lineup. And that was with, I know Eric Decker only played three games, 
but those three games were in the first half of the season. So that big finish for him was including both of those guys for at least part of the time. His efficiency and his numbers definitely dipped off in the last half of the season, but I, the volume that he's going to get this year just due to lack of weapons is is going to more than make up for that. So let's talk about those other weapons on the team first so we can really like pin that point home and make sure you understand that there are literally no other weapons on the team. You got the Spaghetti Bolognier. Robbie Anderson, dude is like 6'3", 190 pounds. He's a deep threat, if anything. Um, he should play the two. He should play opposite Anunwa, but he's not taking 110 targets, 120 targets away from Anunwa. Those are Anunwa's to keep. Uh, Robbie Anderson, like I said, is more of a deep guy. He's a number two, so he'll see his share of 70, 80 targets. Then you have rookie Ardarius Stewart, who they drafted this summer. Now Stewart already missed OTAs, and now he's missing... Uh, mini camp. He just randomly reports came out that he had thumb thumb and groin surgery. He just had them. Now they say he's going to be back for training camp, but who knows? A groin surgery doesn't sound very uh, doesn't sound appealing. And if you watch my videos, you know how much I I dislike you know rookies, especially rookies missing time in the preseason. That really stumps their uh, development. When you have injuries there, you know you don't have, you can't work on timing, you can't work on chemistry and things like that. So I think Ardarius Stewart is. That's going to hurt him a lot. And then the rest of the depth chart is doozy you've definitely never heard of. They have Jalen, unless you're a Jets fan. They have a guy named Jalen Marshall, who would have been the number four, but he's suspended for the first four games of the season because of uh, PED violation, substance abuse violation, that shit. And Todd Bowles came out and said um, his roster spot is up for grabs. They ain't taking no shit this year in gangrene. So those are the top four guys, right? You got a Nunwa, you got Robbie Anderson, who's shaped like a straw. He's in, He's a deep threat. You got Ardarius Seward is going through surgeries, and he's a rookie. And then you have Mr. PED, who won't even be around for the first four games. They literally have no one else on the team. And I don't don't at me with some Austin Sferry and Jenkins bullshit. I ain't going to believe that guy until I see something out of him. Especially the, the Jets' tight end position has been a black hole for the last four years in, in terms of fan, in terms of any production. So basically what it comes down to is even if you don't think Anunwa is a quality receiver, if you don't think he's a good receiver, you shouldn't think that way because he's only he's super young, 25 years old, and to put up a nice campaign like he did last year should say something. But even if you don't, the sheer lack of virtually no one else on the depth chart and that number of targets he's going to get should scream at least low end wide receiver two to you. Realistically, his only targets, his only target competition is Blau Powell and Matt Forte. It gives me even more thought when I'm thinking about it now. Blau Powell is going to be a monster this year. So like I said, you know, as of this video, as of this writing, he's 142 overall wide receiver 55. I would expect Anunwa to probably jump up into the seventh, eighth round by the time real drafts come around. And I'm I'm fine taking a noon one in the eighth round if he's there. I'm interested to see how far his uh, his ADP goes up. He's definitely a better play in PPR because obviously they don't score as much and he's going to get a ton of looks and a ton of, ton of volume. But I like him anywhere to be wide receiver two or wide receiver three with upside. Even if he jumps up to like the sixth round, I'm okay taking him there. Last but not least, certainly not least, my boy, I'm, I'm going down with this ship this year. My man's Cooper Cup out in Los Angeles for the Rams. Their rookie, third round pick out of Eastern Washington. I'm going to go bankrupt with this guy. Thankfully, he doesn't cost a lot to own. At wide receiver 95, 244 overall. So he's literally, he's going undrafted. So you can get him anywhere in, in the last round. I think his hype will build by the time the season comes, but that's a review. So he's a small school product coming out of Eastern Washington, right? But his, his his game, his level of play is not small school. Tore up the Senior Bowl, that whole Senior Bowl week. People were saying he was the most impressive guy there against top talent. He went against Marcus Peters, Sidney Jones throughout college, all first-round talents, and absolutely washed those guys. He was ridiculously productive in college. He set the all-time receiving record, racked up 6,000, let me see, 464 yards over his four-year career. So stupidly productive, consistent. You could take wear and tear and keep going, all that kind of good stuff you like to see. So he's capable of producing anywhere over the field. He can play the slot, he can play the outside, and he's probably gonna start as a slot guy in St. Louis, or Los Angeles, to begin the season. But he's 6'2", about 205, 210 pounds. He's got a really good size to him if they wanna throw him on the outside, which I think they should, because because fuck Robert Woods. But Cup is basically built like Jordan Matthews. Similar in size, but I think Cup is actually better than Matthews. I think he's got a better skill set, he's got way better hands. Cup is like 
very well known for how good uh, how good of hands he has and how strong his hands are. Matthews obviously just drops balls like it's his job. And all the reports coming out this summer are, are just raving about Cup. He was dubbed the star of last month's Rams rookie minicamp by the Los Angeles Daily News' Rich Hammond. Good for you, Richie Hammond. And then ESPN Rams reporter Alden Gonzalez expects a third-round wide receiver Cooper Cup to be Jared Goff's security blanket, a.k.a. that's music to a PPR owner's ears, right? security blanket for a quarterback that can't really chuck the ball that much or they have a really bad line right so he's going to get a ton of pressure he's going to be looking for his immediate outlets and the offensive coordinator matt lafleur said uh he's an extremely polished route runner he's got great hands you could tell he works at his craft each and every day he does a great job here just all raving reviews haven't heard anything bad about the guy and i liked him even before i'm hearing all these reviews and i've been he was in my top 12 rookies all that kind of stuff. And I'm not going to sit here and bullshit you and be like, yeah, he's going to put up, you know, 1,200 yards, 10 touchdowns. I said before, Kenny Britt had five, and the team only passed for 14. Cup's ceiling in terms of touchdowns is probably more in the five to six range, but I think he could easily catch 65 to 70 balls, 800 to 900 yards, a guy that you can get in your last round, and is super valuable if you're in a keeper or dynasty league because this guy will be around for a long time and i could definitely see him in the future putting up some like wes welker type years or or jordan matthews like a freshman sophomore type years in the, in the immediate future as that rams offense eventually like you know grows and prospers a little bit if that ever happened i see cup great hands great size great intangibles really good route running as said by the offense coordinator and now he's got the opportunity there in st louis or fucking los angeles jesus christ NFL's killing me with this shit. So right now, I'll go on record. I'll bet any amount of money Cooper Cup finishes the year with more PPR points than Robert Woods does. Y'all want to take that bet? Sign up below. Leave a comment. Also down below, yeah, I want you to leave a comment. Would you rather have straight up no ADP value? Would you rather have Corey Coleman or Kenny Britt on your team this year? Would you rather have Kinsey and Nunwa or... Oh, I got a good one. Kinsey and Nunwa or Willie Sneed. And then... Lastly, would you rather have Robert Woods or Cooper Cup? Obviously, I'm going with the three guys on my list, but I wanted to I wanted to make it a fair fight. I don't know everything. I don't know shit. I wanted to put some honorable mentions on the list too because these are, like I said, I've been making videos left and right and there are a ton of guys that I do like. Honorable mentions for wide receiver. Obviously, I love Terrell Pryor. I love Larry Fitzgerald for the value that he's giving. You'll probably, if you didn't see my Cardinals uh, outlook, it dropped yesterday, so go check that out. Terrell Williams, Pierre Garçon, Cameron Meredith. So those are five guys I love. So if you're looking at, you know, if you're looking to stack up running backs early, I love all these guys as later round uh, wide receivers. Even Fitch, you can get in like the fourth or fifth round. You can go Terrell Pryor fourth, Larry Fitzgerald fifth, like ridiculous value at those guys. So, so I hope you enjoyed the video as always and give it that thumbs up button. If you enjoyed please subscribe to the channel if you're new share the video to your friends unless you don't want them to win your league then don't share that shit also i'm gonna keep pitching my dad hats i got dad hats on the way some good stuff in production so if you're looking for a fresh dad hat for the summer stay tuned they should be coming in, in a couple weeks and that's all i got for you so follow me on twitter all that good stuff everything is linked in the description and i will see y'all next time Peace out, homies. Have a good day. Have a good weekend. Be safe. Don't drink and drive. Hey, hey, hey. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, hey, hey. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, hey, hey. Don't change. Yeah. I ain't at the party. At the then it ain't started. It ain't started. This is trend setting. You niggas is trend following.